book of Acts, chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4, and we'll be reading down through verse 12. Verse number 1 through 12, we uh, <clears throat> will uh, try to break this up in uh, two or three messages. Uh, although we could go over it, I guess, or most of it in one message, or there's one continuing uh, story there down until we get down uh, toward the bottom. But uh, I wanted to, there's, there's so many things that need to be said there, we probably need to, for time's sake, to uh, divide it up. So we'll read only verse 1 through 12 this morning. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them on in hold until the next day, for it was now even time. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined by the good deed done, to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And now, Father, I ask for the unction to preach and expound upon your word. I claim it because you have chosen me for this position and to preach the gospel. And Lord, I pray now, as we look into the word, that we will receive from you all that you have for us. And Lord, that we will have our understanding open to the things of God, that we may become a more mature Christian in our daily walk. And Lord, I pray now, as always, that you hide me behind the cross, Help me to decrease as you increase in the message. Help me not in any way to block the view of the cross today. But may I magnify you and may we see Jesus in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. I want to speak to you this morning on facing persecution. The church now is beginning to face persecution as was expected because Jesus had already warned them that this would happen. And we'll see this happening all through the book of Acts. Now, before we get into the actual context, we need to look and see what we mean when we talk about persecution. You see, Satan's opposition and attack on the godly has been from the beginning. And after Satan had uh, accomplished his goal in Adam by getting him to succumb to the fruit, the forbidden fruit, and partake of that, and has put creation into a fallen state, now Satan will continue to try to destroy God's kingdom and God's people on earth. His purpose is to do everything he can to disrupt the plan of God by attacking those that would follow him. There are two ways that Satan attempts to destroy God's people and program. One is through persecution from without. 
And we see that here, the beginning of the church. We see the persecution from without. That is one of the ways that he uses to destroy it. The second way is from corruption from within. Now, the corruption from within is his most effective method. And he uses that all that he can whenever he can. But the problem is, until Satan gets an opportunity to get inside, he has to attack from the outside. And the only way he can get inside is when we allow him in or we bring him in through our all through through some of the, the church or some of the people of God. He gets in through them. And this is what we see all the way through history. When we look at the first uh, people on earth after the fall and then Adam and Eve began to have children, the first son born to Adam and Eve was a person that became a tool of Satan because he rejected God's way, so Satan used him. The second son born on earth, Abel, who was a righteous man and followed God, was killed by the firstborn son of Adam and Eve, who became Satan's tomb. So we see Satan beginning his attack outwardly there in the beginning. When you get to Genesis 6 then, you see Satan now has found an opening to get inside, so he begins corrupting from the inside. Because in Genesis 6, what do we see happen? The sons of God marry the daughters of men. So now there is a corruption of the righteous by intermarrying with those that are not righteous. And because of this corruption, it led to such a corrupt state in the world that God had to later send the flood and destroy those that he had created because the whole world had become corrupt. When Satan gets in, he corrupts everything. That's why the Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It doesn't just leaven a little bit. When you put leaven in something, it leavens the whole thing. That's why uh, when you put leaven in dough, it, can, it begins to work and it leavens that whole dough so you can use it to make good bread. Corruption always destroys everything that it gets involved in. You put one rotten rotten uh, potato in a potato sack and all the potatoes will be affected by that one. So corruption now has happened to the entire world and God had to send the flood to destroy that and start anew. So it starts anew with Noah and his family, the man that he had called to be the one that would preserve mankind. And persecution and corruption, Satan has used all down through history. When Abraham was called and the nation of Israel was born through Abraham's descendant Isaac and then Jacob, we find that the Israelites, who was God's chosen people, the attack was on the outside until Satan got in and then he began to work from the inside. All the time Israel was a nation in the land, uh, Satan was always working this way. From the outside and then from the inside. Remember when Balaam uh, was asked by Balak, who was the king of one of the pagan nation, and he wanted to curse Israel because uh, he was afraid of them. He knew that they were powerful because God was on their side, and he knew if he could curse them, then they would not be powerful. They could not uh, come against him. So he got Balaam, who was a hireling prophet. He talked about hirelings last night, those that sell themselves for the dollar, those that are willing to do what they do for the money. They're doing it for the money. And we see last night when he's talking about the pastors that are hireling, they flee when the wolf comes. And 
and lead the flock. They don't uh, stand and protect the flock because they're just a hireling. They're just a paid uh, person. And Balaam became one of those. So Balak hired him to curse Israel. Well, he submitted to try to do that. And he went in four different areas trying to curse Israel. And every time he tried to pronounce cursings upon them, blessings came out of his mouth. Because God would not allow him to curse his people. Well, there's one thing that Balaam taught Balak there. And you find that in the scripture. He said, let me tell you how to destroy the nation. He said, God will not allow me to curse them because they're his people. He will not curse them. But here's how you can destroy them. You can corrupt them. If you get God's people to marry in with your pagan people, then they will become corrupt and God will destroy them. You won't have to. So what Balaam did was teach Balaam how to get the nation of Israel destroyed by getting them corrupt. So Satan always wants to find a way to corrupt the church or the people of God because that's the best way that he can use uh, to destroy. So the church was born and immediately after the church was born, it began to be persecuted because Satan hadn't got inside yet. But when you turn over to Acts chapter 20, you see Paul warning them of this very thing. Paul, having spent three years in Ephesus preaching there at that time, and now he's leaving the church at Ephesus. But if you look in verse 27 through 31, you find this warning that Paul gave to the church. He said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I have preached everything that the Word of God says. And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And look at this. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples for them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So here now Paul is warning the church that Satan is attempting to get in on the inside because that's how he's going to destroy them is by infiltrating them and corrupting them from within. Now, when we look at the church, if we were to go back and look at church history, one of the greatest needs, I think, in the church today is for church history to be taught. If you look back in the early church, you'll find that the church in its purest form, in its purest form, was when it was under great persecution. You will always find the purest church under the greatest persecution. If you were to go today to China, to North Korea, to those areas where the church is under the greatest persecution, even in the Muslim countries where they're very persecuted, you would find a pure church. I mean, people that are totally and completely sold out to God that are following Him there. So when we look at church history then, if we were to take it from the scriptures, from uh, Revelation 2 and 3, where it shows a picture of church history, you'll find that the church of Smyrna, which was the church of the first century into the second century, uh, was a persecuted church. And the church of Smyrna was so persecuted, they were impoverished, they were suffering horrendous uh, ways under the dictators of the uh, uh, those, those Roman emperors. And during, there were like ten emperors, during the ten uh, reign of these ten emperors from Nero to Diocletian, it was a horrible.
horrible time in the church. And God never said one thing bad about the church of Smyrna or the church during that age because it was under such great persecution. It was pure. The church remained pure. When you get to the church at Pergamos after the, after the 300s in the 4th century and Constantine comes to power as the emperor, here's what you see. Constantine, because Satan had given him a vision of the cross, he showed Constantine how he could conquer the world by using the sign of the cross. And Constantine, then here's what he did. Instead of persecuting the Christians, he came back and he had all of his soldiers to be baptized claiming to be Christians and claiming they accepted Christianity. Now he's taken all of the Christians that are under persecution and he has brought them out and he has blessed them. He's given them uh, good jobs. He's put them in respectable positions and raised them up from, from persecution to being uh, important people. What was Satan doing? He was no, he knew that if he can get the political government into the church and get the church involved in the political government, then the political government could use the church and destroy the church. And that's what happened. That's what he was doing. So what he did, the Christians became uh, important. They became wealthy. They became uh, uh, people that were uh, very, very uh, well treated and given all kind of things. So what did that do? Did that bless the church? Did that make the church any better? No, that corrupted the church. Because what you see now is the church and the world married and the church became weaker and weaker and all down through church history until you find the Reformation, you find the church gets weaker and weaker and the church itself, the religious movement, the church itself becomes a persecutor of those that are the true believers and that's what we saw when the Roman church began to persecute those that really want to follow God. So that's the danger that Satan knows if I can get inside, I can corrupt and destroy. And that's why it was so important what he was preaching last night that we understand anytime the church, anyway, gets in line or connects, becomes a part of the political movement, it is destroying the church. The political movement always wants to use the church to promote itself and it will destroy God's church. That's why we can never, we can never get involved with the political system. That's what Constantine did in his day. But we know we never learn from history. That's why we repeat history because we never learn from it. So persecution down through the ages has always happened. And now when we get to the place where we are now, you know what, what's happening now? There's no persecution on the church. But there's also no power. Because when there is no persecution in the church, you see a weak church. You see a church without power. And Satan is always interested in getting the church into wealth, into prosperity, into an easy life, into luxury, into pleasure, into compromise. And that's where he has the church today. And the church is absolutely powerless in America. Yes. And here's what yes. you would find out. If there was to be real repentance and the church was to really become alive today, you would see persecution from the outside began like you never ever saw it or would ever think about it. Because this world hates God. This world hates the church. And the reason we're not seeing it today is because the church is so weak in America that Satan does not need to attack from the outside because right. he has the church control from the inside and the church has no power. And here in the book of Acts, all you have to do is just look at the church immediately after it was born. It went into persecution. 
And you will always see the church in persecution when it's really standing for God. Wherever it is, it will always be facing persecution. Now look at what Jesus had warned them. Go back to John chapter 15 and look at what Jesus had already told them they could expect from uh, following him. In uh, chapter 15, look at verse 18. He says here, if the world hates you, it was him speaking to his disciple. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He's saying because the world hates you, it's because of me. You identify with me. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And that's the same in any age. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sins, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto me for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. The world who does not know God is always going to persecute the church. That's the way it is. And that's the way it will continue to be. And even if you were to look in John 16, the next chapter over, just look at John 16 and verse number 2. Verse number 2. He says here, They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. So this, this thing was not something that they should not have realized was happening. Even Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He didn't say it may, may be a time when you have, shall suffer. That means that you will be persecuted if you really, truly follow God. Now, when we get to the context here in chapter 4, look at what's happening. Peter has just preached. They have just healed a lame man and they have done it under the authority of God or the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what does it say in verse 1 chapter 4? And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now here they are and it says as they spake, so Peter and John both were speaking there. They were uh, both talking to the people. And now, here they come. Here they come. Who's coming? Well, there, there's the priest. There's the priest he talks about. Now, these were just the ordinary priests that were conducting the evening sacrifice. The uh, priesthood was divided up into a number of priests, and each uh, uh, priest would be scheduled to serve in the temple at a certain time. He would take his place and be available for service. And this is the priest that worked on duty this day that was there. And then there's the captain of the temple. Now the captain was the head of the temple security or the temple police. They would also have been Levites. Now the captain would be second in rank to the high priest. And he was always there to maintain order on the temple grounds. The Roman government, who had ultimate authority, had given this right to the Jews to police the grounds of their own temple. So they did that. And then there's the Sadducees. The Sadducees. The Sadducees was one of the four sects that made up Judaism. In this day, the Sadducees were the one that were really in power, and the priests during this time were from the Santa group called the Sadducees. There was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots, those four groups. Now, the Sadducees were the liberals. The Pharisees were the conservatives, if you want to break it down in how we do it today. You know, 
politically in our country, we in our nation, we've got everything liberal or conservative, and we've even got that in the church. See, that's another way that shows that we we joined the political movement because even in churches now we we say it's a liberal or a conservative church and taking on the the wording of the of the uh, political system. But the Sadducees were the liberals. They didn't believe in the resurrection, and you can find that, I believe it's in Matthew 22, 23. I believe it there it says they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in any spirits. And they didn't believe in anything really that would be spiritual up beyond what you can see or know today. They, they were just those that just believed that everything happens as we uh, make it happen. We're, we're in our own, uh, we're control of our own lives. God doesn't intervene. There's no such thing as that. They were the ones that were in power during this time. Now, the Sadducees were very wealthy people. Most of them had, had uh, lands and houses and things and, and were very wealthy and they were dominating the religious system and the political system system during these days here. So there they were. This group came out. Now look at verse 2. It said being grieved, being grieved, they were very troubled. They were very disturbed because of what they were doing. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now the first thing they were upset about is that they were teaching people without any credentials from the priest. They hadn't gotten any recommendation from the priest. So they had no credentials to be out teaching. Another reason, they were uneducated and unlearned. It says that on over in the text, if you continue to read in chapter 4. Which means they were not trained in the law. They were ignorant to uh, the law as far as those that had been trained in it. This is one reason they were upset. But there was a greater reason that made them upset, and we see that there in the last part of that verse, that they were preaching Jesus, that he had rose from the dead, and that he was the reason for resurrection. Now this is what really upset them, because they had just put him to death just a little while before, and now here these apostles come and they're preaching Jesus that he rose from the dead and is now alive, and through his authority, we are doing what we do. Now what did they do? Well, verse 3, they arrested them. They arrested them, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold. They put them in custody until the next day, for it was now even time. And that was too late to arrange the, the Sanhedrin. It was too late for the court to uh, come together and have a trial. So they will put them in custody until tomorrow and then they will have the court and they will try them. That's what's going to happen. So here, immediately after the birth of the church, we say Peter and John now, being arrested for their preaching of the gospel. Now, look at verse 4. How be it many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. They had a great response to the message that they were preaching. Such a response that now the total men that have come to believe in Jesus is 5,000 or more. A great number. And this is also upsetting the religious elite in Israel. Now, what is happening? Well, they, if you look at they wouldn't convene the court for Peter and John. And the reason for that is it was, a, there was a law against holding court at night. But you see, they ignored that law when they brought Jesus in because they had his court at night. So what they were intending to do when they arrested Jesus and when they tried him, they didn't care about the law. They just threw it out, threw it aside because they was intended to find him guilty so they could crucify him. 
So now we see they, in this case, they respect the law and say, well, we'll wait till tomorrow and we'll try them. Now, look at verse 5. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, this is the Sanhedrin that's coming together, and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas. Now, Annas was the ex-high priest. He would uh, be considered the patriarchal high priest who was still alive, but the Roman government had given the high priest position to his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And he was actually ruling in that position at this time. And John and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the household of the high priest, were gathered together in Jerusalem. Here is the Sanhedrin that have come together, and all the, uh, the priest's family, and those that would be a part of that, they're going to try Peter and John. Now look at how they, how they handle themselves. There's, a, there's something we need to understand. I think we can learn from this. How we handle persecution. How we respond to it when we face that time. All through the Bible, the New Testament, and you find, especially through the book of Acts, when the church was going through persecution, you can find a way to respond to persecution that's biblical. The first thing, they did not resist. They submitted to the arrest. They did not resist it. This is something very important. For a believer, when he is being persecuted for the cause of Christ, he is not to resist persecution, but he's to submit to it. And that's what the apostles always did. Now in our day, we see folks that just try to uh, try to become a victim so they can promote themselves and say we're in some kind of persecution and they're always trying to uh, uh, fight against it, you know. They're always, that, that, that's not the way God's people do. So look at verse 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they, were, uh, they, they had the Sanhedrin together, now they put John and Peter in the midst of a semicircle. They're sitting there on the floor, and there's the judges around them. And they're going to begin questioning them. And the first thing they ask, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, Peter and John didn't have to worry about submitting to the authorities because they knew God is the one that's in control. And whatever happens, he has them there for a purpose. So they asked them, who and by whose authority did you do this? Now you also got to understand that there was a miracle performer. They couldn't deny that. And as we read on over in the text, you'll find that. They'll say that, well, nobody can deny that there has been a miracle performed here. So we have to look at that as being legitimate. And that's one of the reasons they didn't uh, take them any farther because they couldn't deny the miracle. But here they are and they're questioning them on whose authority did you do this thing? Now, verse 8 is something that's very important because this also tells us how we are to face temptation and that is we must be filled with the Spirit. Because verse 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. He said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, when we are filled with the Spirit and we walk, yielded to the Spirit, that's what that actually, being filled with the Spirit, being yielded to the Spirit, the world the Spirit has full control of you. And Paul talked about that in Ephesians 5, how that we are to be filled with the Spirit. That's our uh, duty as Christians to live that way. And when now we see Peter who was full of the Holy Ghost, he was directed by the Holy Ghost so he knew exactly how to answer these folks. And look at what happened. The next thing is, and this is what we need to do if we're ever persecuted, take every opportunity that you have to give the gospel. That's what he does. Here in the midst of the persecution, look at 
The way he handles it from the way a lot of folks today would handle it in the nation that we live in where there is no persecution. They want to claim they're persecuted. The first thing they did, they didn't resist. The second thing they did, Peter was full of the Holy Spirit. So he was not getting his direction from God. And the third thing he did was take the opportunity to give the gospel, not fight against the persecution. Here was a great opportunity. So Peter, the very thing he does is preach to those that were in authority there, the head of the uh, uh, religious movement of Israel, the head of Judaism. He's got the opportunity to preach to the Sanhedrin of all people. And now he takes that opportunity immediately and does not resist or back down. He says, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Listen to Peter. Boy, he, he, he's, really, he's really full of God. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand before you whole. I mean, bold as a lion, given the gospel, not saying we're going to sue you for treating us this way. We're going to get the best lawyer and we're going to come against you. We're going to put this in every newspaper. We're going to get out across the land. We're going to get a movement up and we're going to throw you out of office. That isn't what they did. He preached the gospel because that's our duty. That's our job. That's our responsibility in every situation is to preach the gospel because all persecution gives us an opportunity to preach the gospel. That's what Paul did when he was in prison all of these years. He used his imprisonment as a means to get the gospel to those in power in Rome he would have never been able to reach otherwise. Now look at verse 11. Peter continues. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. He quotes them from the Psalms because he knew they would know these scriptures. And he, he brings the scriptures into view and he shows them what the scriptures actually mean in relation to Christ. He said this stone, this stone that was rejected, that was rejected by you all has become the head, the very corner stone, the very chief cornerstone is what that means. And he was talking about Jesus. This one you rejected is now the chief cornerstone. And look at verse 12. And this is a very important verse because this really did upset them. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He's saying the only name, the only person, the only name that there is any salvation in is in the name of the one that you crucified and put to death that God has raised from the dead. He preached the gospel. They didn't like that, but he took the opportunity. Now, in our land today, what is the most hated name yes. out there? The name Jesus. You can talk about God, that means anything. Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius, God, the, the money, the fame, a fortune, or pleasure. It, 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 God is a generic term. Until you identify him as the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we call him Jesus. Yes. Now you talk about getting folks upset. Yes. That's why all of the government agencies have put out strict, strict rules. That when you lead in prayer, you can't talk about Jesus, nor can you pray 
in the name of Jesus, making a mock of prayer is what they're doing. And who in the world would want to pray if you can't pray in the name that will get you connected to God, which is Jesus. Yes. I uh, heard them talking on Moody this week. They were talking about uh, when, when they say, uh, well, we're not going to use the word God or the word uh, uh, Jerusalem in their platform, and then they later came back and put it in. And these guys were saying, what well, does it make we use it or not if you don't mean nothing by it when you say it? I mean, what good, what difference does it make? Because when you talk about God, what does it mean to you? It's not meaning the God of heaven, the God of the Bible, which is Jesus. Yes. But this is what upsets folks. And this is what's going to upset the world in our day. When we go out and begin begin specifically preaching that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. That will upset people. Because it's not hard to go out and preach religion. People don't mind you talking about religion. They don't want you to talk about Christianity, which is exclusive that we come through Jesus Christ, who is the only name for their yes, salvation. Yes. And he even made that statement in John 14 himself when he was talking to his disciples. He says, I am the way. Yes. I am not a way. I am the way. Yes. I am the truth. I am not just some of the truth. I am the truth. All of it. I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Yes. If you have life, you have him. If you don't have him, you don't have life. Nor will you ever have life. Nor will you ever get to heaven. Unless you come through Jesus Christ. That's what upsets people today. You don't even hear that in most churches today. Because we've become politically correct. We have bowed to religion. We might upset the Buddhist. We might upset the Muslim. We might upset the uh, Orthodox Jew. We, we, we might upset some other group. So we just refrain when we're in their presence from using these terms or this terminology. Boy, Peter didn't. He jumped all over that. And he took every opportunity he had to preach Jesus Christ. So how do we handle persecution? We first do not resist. We submit to it. Second, we must be filled with the Spirit if we're able to do it effectively. Third, we're to take every opportunity that we have to preach the gospel in our persecution. Fourth, we're to be obedient to God at all costs. Because as you look on over here in the text, you'll find that they said, look at verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now this is after they threatened them and told them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. We're going to let you boys go, but we don't want to hear you talking about Jesus no more. Well, they said we're going to obey God rather than man. And here's what it comes down to. We don't bow to the government. If you bow to the government, the government becomes God and replaces God. We bow to God only. And we obey God regardless of what the cost is to us by obeying God. We don't compromise to get an easier life or to have an easier life. That's why how in the world could a Christian, a true believer of Jesus Christ, full of the Holy Ghost, ever become a, 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 some kind of a political man that's, that's elected by the politicians and sitting in the seat in Washington, 
How in the world? Because you have to uh, compromise in so many areas and refrain from speaking truth about Jesus. How in the world are you going to do that? You can't. So we're to be obedient to God at all costs. Fifth thing, we're to be thankful because they came out of here praising God. They were thankful, why? That they were found worthy to be persecuted for his sake. Thankful, my goodness, that's something. If God allows us the privilege to face persecution for his sake, we should be thankful. And then there's a sixth thing, and they desired that they would have greater boldness to continue doing this. Look at verse 29 over there. He said, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak the word. Lord, you just give us more boldness that the next time we'll be able to continue to speak for you in a greater way than we have now. Now, what do we see? We'll see the continual uh, persecution. And you're going to see a little later that Stephen becomes the first martyr in the early church because they get so upset and so upset at his message that he preaches that they take him and they stone him to death. And Paul, uh, who was Saul at that time, begins his movement to totally wipe out the church and God stops him. And we see this continuing and God using the persecution of the Christians to get the gospel out around the world. Now I close with this. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you come to Christ today or if you come to God today, you may have heard somebody tell you that you can get to God through any road. There are many roads that lead to Rome, but there's only one road that leads to heaven. And there may be those that tell you that as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter who you call God, you're really sincere, so you're, you're putting that person in that place. Yes, it matters who you call God. Because the one that died on the cross for our sins, Jesus Christ is the only payment that we have for our sins. There's no way we can bypass the cross and get to heaven. If we get to God, we come through Jesus and no other. And today, if you're listening to me, and you have in your mind what someone has told you about getting to heaven, they may have said, well, if you'll just try to be as good as you can, you'll make it. Or if you'll just try to uh, live up to a certain standard or certain rules and regulations, you'll make it. Or you can follow this religion. They don't believe in the Jesus way, but they're sincere and, and they do a lot of good things. Then you'll still make it. You'll just make it by a different road. Let me tell you all that is lies and heresy. And Jesus said, I am the way, the yes. truth, and the life. No man, no man, no individual, that word means can come to the Father except by me. Yes. And when there's no other name and there is salvation in no other, and no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, but Jesus that's exactly what that means. And that means you'll either bow to Christ, you'll either bow to Jesus as Lord, or you will go to hell. There is no two ways about it. So today, I would ask you, have you bowed to Him? Have you trusted Him? Are you living with Him as Lord of your life? If not, then you are headed for destruction. Yes. Jesus, the only way. Let's stand and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have given us another opportunity to be in your house. Father, I pray today that you'll help us to 
not only realize ourselves as we do because we have come to you and trusted you as Lord and Savior, but realize as we're out in this world that the only message that's going to help folks is the message of the cross, the message of the gospel, because it's Jesus and no other. Help us to be aware of that and be ready, be ready to give that message. Help us to be ready and willing to face persecution if it so comes to that. And Lord, take us from here today and use us to your honor and glory. And we'll give you praise because you're worthy.